Hey everyone, Chat Cemetery is back. Today I am joined by Dennis Freeman and we are discussing nightmares and dreamscapes. Dennis, this is your first episode on the podcast, so I want to give you a chance to introduce yourself to the listeners. You will be back on future episodes, but I'd like to do this for everyone's first episode on the show. All right. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. Like she said, my name is Dennis. Um, I'm a writer from Clarksville, Arkansas. And I've been a huge Stephen King fan since man, I was probably 10 when my mom introduced me. So it's uh, really exciting to be on this podcast. Well, I'm very happy to have you. And Stephen King's short story collections are sometimes hit or miss. So to start off this conversation, I just want to get a feel for your overall thoughts on the collection as a whole. Was it too long? Do you typically enjoy his short story collections? Well, when it comes to the short story, it's my favorite medium. Again, that was one of my big introductions to Stephen King was his, uh, was his short stories. But um, this particular collection, Nightmares and Dreamscapes, I enjoy it. But it kind of felt like he was uh, it kind of felt like he was emptying his desk on this one. It was a lot of them. It didn't have an overall theme, a lot of good stories, but some of them were hit or miss for me. Yeah, I feel the same about this collection. It's just one of those where you get such a mix of stories. And personally, at least so far, my favorite collection of his has been different seasons, despite not liking the final story as much as the previous three, but that just seemed to have more of a common theme. And I know those were novellas as opposed to short stories, but more often than not, you get a mix. He'll toss in a novella or two, something that's, you know, around a hundred pages, a little over a hundred pages in most of his collections, at least from what I've read so far. And you have some in here, like Suffer the Little Children that were supposed to be in other collections. That one in particular was supposed to be a night shift. So they do apparently do some editing when it comes to his collections <laughs> as well, but it seems to be few and far between because the stories, a lot of the stories at least, have already been published. So he's just pulling from, you know, his magazine submissions and things like that. You do have some unpublished works in this one and in a lot of his collections, honestly. But for the most part, I would say there's a chance that people could already be familiar with some of these stories, especially if they were keeping up with Stephen King at the time and not coming to him much later like I was just because, you know, I wasn't around when he started writing. And another question I have for you real quick before we dive into some of our favorite and least favorite stories how do you feel about the pacing of short story collections? Does it not really occur to you that you're reading this long book of Stephen King's because the stories are much shorter? Well, as far as the pacing of short stories go, getting through the entire collection to me seems it's a lot easier to put down. Um, you know, you start a story, especially when you enjoy, you get through it, you go to the next one, you get through it. And at any point, between you can stop after a story without feeling like you're missing something. But I mean, for the most part, the pacing to me doesn't really, doesn't really come into play when it comes to the short story collections. Yeah. For me, it's just one of those things where how I feel about the pacing depends on how long it takes me to get through a collection, because even if the stories are well paced, if I have a few days where I don't read. And then I'm like, oh, okay, I kind of get back to these short stories. And sometimes his collections can go on for so long. And I think this is one of the longer ones I've read other than the novellas in the Bachman books, because I have that complete one with rage included. So there are times where it feels like a chore to get through some of these collections. But this one, I think, was more about me not necessarily just sitting down and reading for longer stretches of time. It's like, oh, I have time to read a story here and a story there. So it took me a little longer to get through, but I don't think that was the fault of the pacing of the stories itself, just the pacing of myself <laughs> trying to read the entire collection. Oh yeah, I completely understand. So let's dive into the actual stories now. I want to kick this off with our favorite stories because those are going to be a little more fun to talk about. So what were some of your favorite stories from this collection? Well, as far as my favorites went, um, Omni's Last Case was probably 
was uh, my number one because I just kind of like the idea of a writer intentionally throwing himself into his story, changing things by thinking about it, using bringing his typewriter to the, or not his typewriter, but bringing his computer, uh, I believe it was a Toshiba, back to the 1940s, like late 30s, early 40s, and using it to kind of rearrange, <laughs> rearrange the furniture, so to speak. It was really cool. Yeah. And I think a close second was, you know, they've got a hell of a band. Just the thought of all of these rock and roll legends ending up in the same place because it kind of plays into that whole, uh, you know, Elvis isn't dead. He just went home type of uh, type of thing. But except everybody there is dead and all they do is they have their own little town, but they and they have their own jobs, but they still have these just massive and amazing concerts. And I think, yeah. A, yeah, right. I think an updated version of that would probably be really cool considering all the legends that have came and gone since then. Yeah. Those two are definitely ones that I found enjoyable and are certainly top tier for me. And I know you have another one to discuss, but just quick notes on these two. I did enjoy, you know, the kind of detective story of Umney's last case, the private Dick feel to it. And then, you know, they got a hell of a band it was just so fun. It was one of those where you didn't necessarily have to have a lot of meat on the story. It was just something he was having fun with. You didn't have to dive too deep into the story to really understand what he was getting at. It was just like, you know what? Here's a fun concept. Let me run with it and see what happens. Yeah, definitely. Um, like that one, it kind of felt like he wrote that one like straight from the hip. Like he didn't aim at yeah. all. <laughs> it was really cool. It was kind of like, you know, and then you had my third, which would have been like cr uh, Crutch End. Um, it was very Lovecraftian, the Cthulhu feel. That mm -hmm. one, that one, that's part of the reason it was, it was very simplistic horror and it paid homage to Lovecraft. And regardless of my opinions of him as a person, <laughs> Lovecraft is arguably one of the most prolific uh, horror writers of all time. So, um, it was definitely really cool to see uh, Stephen King's take on that. I have a confession to make. I have not read any Lovecraft that I am aware of. So I should probably do that at some point, given that Stephen King does seem to pull some influence from him. Oh, yeah, definitely. And a lot of, I mean, over the years, a lot of people have. I mean, just even DC Comics with Arkham Asylum. Arkham was yes. H.P. Lovecraft, so... Yeah, I can definitely sense those vibes there. It's one of those things where I've been familiar with his work without having read it just because of yeah. how many people are influenced by it. There are certain works that you just know, like, you know, almost everyone probably knows Dracula. Doesn't mean you've read Dracula, but you know <laughs> who Dracula Very is. <laughs> so it's one of those things for me. And while I mentioned that the three you brought up were higher tier for me, I think my two favorites coming out of this were Suffer the Little Children, which I mentioned briefly a moment ago, and The House on Maple Street. Suffer the Little Children was just so cruel and horrific that it just felt so very Stephen King at his peak. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it was just something that caught my attention right away and I couldn't really shake it. I was just like, that was so creepy. I love it. And oh, yeah. The house on Maple Street was a little different because it did end up having a sci-fi element to it, but I really enjoy King's writing of children. There's this innocence about them that just seems to make them so much smarter than everyone else when he's writing them. And the curiosity of the kids in this house and them just trying to sort of sneak around and figure things out and be like, what is going on? And then all of a sudden the house just takes off. and while the sci-fi element wasn't my favorite part of it, I think it was still strong enough for me to safely say it's one of my favorites. Oh yeah, and you know, House on Maple Street, um it was it was definitely a good story and Stephen King at any age, I don't know how he does it, but he's very good at capturing how kids talk to each other, which is something that I don't think a lot of adults can do. It's something I don't like to try um, because it's so difficult, but he's always been very good at it. Like the sci-fi elements in that one, I, I wasn't a big fan of, but I mean, it, it was a, it was a solid short story and um, you know, suffer the little children. 
I don't know, like that one, I don't know how it, like I had, I picked three top ones. That is still easily top five. It was, I mean, everything about it was just absolutely, it, it was crazy from the beginning. And uh, like Miss Headley is, I mean, we all had a T, we all had Miss Headley at some point. And I think Stephen King probably did too. It was just a really fun take on teacher revenge mixed with, I don't even know what they were. They kind of reminded me of the, uh, of the, um, uh, the, the Tahine from, uh, the tower books. Okay. I have not quite finished the tower books. I believe I am going to be on book number four. No, no, it's totally fine. The thing about this podcast is that I know his works are so old at this point that I'm not going to be upset about any sort of spoilers. It's just one of those things where, I've somehow managed to avoid them for so long, especially with the Dark Tower series, because people love that so much. I was like, I'm kind of impressed that it hasn't been spoiled for me. So I have no idea what you're talking about. So to me, that's not a spoiler. But, you know, I know what you mean by saying that Suffer the Little Children is sort of this teacher revenge story that I think a lot of people will connect with in one way or another. And, you know, these are obviously our top tier ones. And I will say if you're a Sherlock fan, you will definitely want to check out the doctor's case, at least because that is his Holmes and Watson story, which oh yeah, it, it was fun, but it was one of those things where, you know, he's not working with his own IP basically. So it's not as exciting for me. It's just like, oh yeah, he went and did a Sherlock story. That's cool. Yeah. And oh wow, public domain. It's definitely not the worst thing in here. <laughs> definitely. Oh no, it's definitely not bad. It was just like anytime I see I don't know, anytime I see especially established uh established writers work with like old um, you know, public domain stuff, I just uh it's touch and go for me. Even like, you know, you could you could write a pretty they did some epic, you know, work with things like grim fairy tales over the years, but I'm just not, that's just not my thing. Right. Well, I think it's time to move on to some of our least favorites. The main one we share in common, which is head down his (laughs) essays about Owen's little league baseball team, (laughs) Yeah, which make absolutely no sense to put into a Stephen King collection of fictional stories. (laughs) It was just one of those things where it stuck out like a sore thumb. And it's not even that it was bad writing. It was just no, it was baseball writing, so it did not fit at all. They should have put this, you know, as a little thing on the end of what is his baseball book, Blockade Billy, or the Red Sox book that he did with Peter Straub, like. Put this in one of those so it at least makes sense. Right. It was like a it was like watching uh Tarantino and Romero work together on um what is it, Dusk Till Dawn. It was just, hey, this is a really good story, and then in the middle of it, hey, you know what, we're just gonna do something else. That's kind of how it felt. <laughs> yeah, it was a super weird inclusion. And I think that was by far the low point for me. And it wasn't even that I hated any of the stories, it was just that felt so out of place. And I know you want to talk about rainy season, which was a super weird story. I was just like, oh yeah, that's, that's a weird one too. So I'll, I'll let you discuss your thoughts on that one. (laughs) Well, as far as rainy season goes, if, if you're familiar with any, like anybody familiar with some of my work, like um, the Terrorverse slasher survival school, I am a huge fan of horror cliches. And this had just about all of them. A young couple, uh, middle of nowhere, um, the dual citizen trying to talk them out of staying. And it was a great setup for a supernatural slasher, but I got toads with razor sharp teeth. It was very, um, and it's not, like I said, we, we always go back to this. The writing isn't bad. It just, I had absolutely zero clue what the hell was going on. And it comes back. Yeah. yeah and it goes like, um, and this is one that I've read. And also one that I've heard narrated and I cannot remember the narrator, but her voice just was not it for me. Um, I, God, what was her name? Oh yeah. She was in one of the Stephen King adaptations, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Yeah. Let's see. Yeardley Smith. That's who it was. 
Yes, great actress, probably a really great person, but I just was not feeling her as a narrator. It drove me, her her voice just drove me crazy. But yeah, that was one story that I just could not figure out. She also voices Lisa Simpson, so that might explain a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. But yeah, I can't even remember what she was in off the top of my head. But I remember as soon as I heard her voice, I was like, oh, here we go. Yeah. And she had also, she's also, I think, played bit parts and various horror. Um, if I'm not mistaken, um, like uh, Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon, she was like the librarian. Uh, I mean, she's been in, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think she's been in a lot of stuff like that. It was Maximum Overdrive, which that, probably yeah. explains why I forgot it was Maximum Overdrive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was... Uh, I don't think anybody likes to remember Maximum Overdrive. I don't even think Stephen King likes it. <laughs> it's one of those fun, really bad movies. <laughs> definitely, yeah. It was. It definitely makes my top five of bad movies, but it, it could be a lot of fun. Yeah, well, there are a few other stories that we should probably mention just because of their significance that came later on with adaptations and things like that. And the one that kicks off the collection is... Dolan's Cadillac. And it's just sort of this fun little revenge story. And you can see that the character is doing all of this planning and, you know, trying to be so meticulous about it. And it got an adaptation later on that stars Christian Slater. So it wasn't something that was adapted right away after it came out, which I kind of like it a little better when they do that. Sometimes I can see that at times, it'll feel like certain adaptations have been rushed because they're like, oh, this story came out. We should adapt it right away. And it'll be like something that goes straight to TV or yeah. you know, video on demand or whatever it was at the time. You know, like the sometimes they come back movies. I'm just like, were those even in theaters? I know the sequels weren't. I don't think they were anyway. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And as far as Dolan's Cadillac goes, it is honestly not one of my favorite stories. I think mostly because it just lacks that horror supernatural aspect as for, as for like taking it for what it is, it's a great story. It's just not what I wanted in a Stephen King, um, you know, <laughs> short stories, but it's definitely, I mean, we can't argue that, you know, that it's anything but great, but it's still just not for me. Yeah, and this collection came out in 93. That story was originally published in Castle Rock Magazine in 1985, and the adaptation didn't come out until 2009. So that is a lot more recent in the eyes of Stephen King adaptations anyway. So it was something that people left alone for a little while, unlike The Night Flyer, which got an adaptation that I have yet to watch, but it was a 1997 film. So it's coming up here pretty soon at some point <laughs> this right. year. But I think that's one that might not be as high of quality. And I think it's just one of those things where people eat up the Stephen King stories so much that they're willing to make any adaptation of them, especially in the 80s and 90s, I think more so than now. Now it seems like they're kind of thinking it through a little more and being like, okay, what one should we do again? Like the Stan miniseries that'll be on CBS All Access in the future. And, you know, the It movies, which I know some people don't like chapter two as much as the first one, and that's fine. But there's just a lot more you can do with the movies now oh, yeah. than you could in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. And now I don't really under, like, I don't really understand the hate that got, but yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree. Like, especially, I wish Stephen King would have been more choosy when it came to some of his adaptations and who directed <laughs> them and and how they were introduced to the public but i mean it's been 30 years now it's whatever <laughs> he's he's gonna do what he does yeah he is making all the money probably <laughs> so he's just like yeah go for it and i know it's never really been about the money for him if anyone has ever read his book on writing or knows his history in general, he did struggle a lot. So writing was his escape and he threw Carrie in the trash until his wife plucked it out and was like, no, you're going to finish this. It's going to be good. And so that we have Carrie now because of Tabitha King. Yeah, definitely. We have a huge bibliography thanks to Tabitha King in that moment. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I am here for all of the Stephen King content, good or bad. It's just 
so fun to see how much he's been able to accomplish in his career and the fact that he's as old as he is now and he's still going. He doesn't seem like he's slowing down at all. You know, we have new books coming this year, at least one, maybe two. And the Institute came out last year, which was a fun read. So oh, yeah. you have so many things going on that even the bad adaptations are interesting to watch because then you're like, okay, clearly he had no involvement in this. You can kind of tell. <laughs> and Maximum Overdrive was the result of him trying to direct his own work, which clearly didn't work out to the point where he was like, no, I'm not going to direct anything anymore. <laughs> but one of the other stories I quickly want to mention here is It Grows on You, because this is sort of a follow-up to Needful Things. Even though Needful Things was billed as the final Castle Rock story or the last Castle Rock story, which we now know not to be true. So I just thought it was interesting to include this in a collection right after calling Needful Things the last Castle Rock story. So it kind of acts as more of an epilogue for Castle Rock, I think. But now we have the show and I'm kind of glad Needful Things wasn't the last Castle Rock story. Yeah. And, you know, to be to be completely honest here, kind of like you were with Lovecraft. Uh, I have not read Needful Things. Um, okay. It's it's always, it's been on my list, but I just have never gotten around to it. I've always, by the time I get around to it, um, it's time to reread it or, you know, I, I don't <laughs> know. Like, I think I read it once or twice a year because I just, it's one of my favorites, but yeah, definitely something I need to get through this year is Needful Things. It's certainly a long one. And because I am doing this podcast, you know, my time constraints are like, okay, I have maybe two weeks to get this book done if I start it right now. <laughs> and so putting myself on that deadline has made it a little difficult to retain everything. But I think as I go, I'm making these connections that I otherwise wouldn't necessarily have made if I had spaced out everything in a much longer time frame. You know, it's one of those things where I think people can enjoy Stephen King without feeling the need to make all of these connections. But it's something that I've found has been fun to do with the podcast because then, you know, maybe myself and my guests are helping people realize things that maybe wouldn't have clicked with them if they didn't read or watch these things back to back to back. Yeah, definitely. And that that's kind of, you know, that like you are apparently a saint because I would have burned out so long ago trying to do, <laughs> especially some of the some of the stuff uh you know, when you added the TV shows and the miniseries and all that, like I I don't think I could have done it. That is you have amazing patience. That would drive me crazy trying to get through some of that. I actually get excited when I have a stretch of two or three movies just because those are typically easier to get through than an entire book or a short story collection because Stephen King just writes so much. So I'm like, oh, yes, three weeks of movies. <laughs> and so that's kind of why I did that because there's no way I could do a book every single week. I would have had to make it like a podcast every two weeks or a monthly podcast. So I was like, you know what? I've watched enough of the movies already to where I know I'm interested in them. I wasn't necessarily as interested in the TV stuff, but I was like, all right, if I'm going to do the movies, I might as well do the TV stuff. And someone had asked me when I started this, if I was going to break up all the short stories into episodes. And I was like, oh, no, oh, no, I am not God. going to do that because they are published in collections not in chronological order. So I would have had to read like, you know, two stories and nightmares and dreamscapes and then go to night shift or, you know, it would have just been all over the place. And my <laughs> brain was like, no, we're doing the collections. I, I know I said I'm going chronologically, but by published books is what yeah. I'm going with. I was going to say you, you love punishment, but not that much. I yeah, understand. yeah, exactly. And I think if I did that, it would add another good 50 to 100 episodes of the podcast. And I was just like, no, no, we're not doing that. And, you know, Nightmares and Dreamscapes alone was full of 20 short stories, one teleplay, which was sorry, right number, one poem, and then the nonfiction essay. And there is no way I would have done an entire episode on Head Down. I am sorry, Stephen King, but that was not happening. No, that wouldn't happen for me either. He can keep that. 
in something like the Brooklyn August poem that came right after and kind of paired with Head Down because it was about baseball, it's like, I'm not going to do a whole episode on a poem. That's that's a bit much. That would be like a five-minute episode. <laughs> right. Yeah. That That was an odd inclusion in that, too. Yeah. It was one I was willing to hand wave a little more just because it was like a one page, one and a half page poem. It wasn't super long. It didn't really get in the way. But are there any other stories in particular you want to mention? Not right offhand, no. Um, like I was saying, like, you know, the the, the top five were definitely uh oh, well actually one. Uh, what was it called? The finger. Um the moving finger, I believe is what it was called. Yes, the moving finger. Yeah. It was so so insane. Uh, and it wasn't even that it was a, uh, you know, for me, it wasn't about just good or bad story. I really enjoyed the inclusion of it uh, strictly because it was so odd. I'm trying to remember where I think it had originally published in a um, magazine of fantasy and science fiction. Yes. In 1990. It was 1990. Okay. But yeah, it was for me, it was just so fun. Um, asinine and just, Still, and to me, it was scary because the whole concept of just this haunted finger was—I <laughs> I, I don't even know how to explain it. But yeah, that one is an honorable mention for me because it was just so fun. Uh, Popsy was pretty good, and I think the ten o'clock people. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it was like out of nowhere. It's like you know, he has this way of drawing you in with something that you don't think is all that interesting. He makes it interesting and then says to hell with it. We're making a monster movie. So it was, it was really exciting for me that that one in particular. Yeah. And the teleplay, sorry, right number ended up appearing in the fourth season of tales from the dark side. So that one was adapted as well, but more in the anthology series, which I think is a pretty good way to go. If you're going to do some of King's short stories, there are plenty of them to choose from that either haven't been adapted or did not get good adaptations. Yeah. And it's one of those things where I think you could do something with just, you know, Stephen King stories, Joe Hill stories, which they did with the new creep show on shutter. And I enjoyed a lot of those episodes. So it's nice to see that they aren't afraid to also just be like, you know what, this is a 30-page story, 20-page story, whatever. We're not going to try and make it into a feature-length film. So to see that happening so early on in his career with things like Creepshow and Tales from the Dark Side, and the fact that they're still continuing that, I think is really nice to see. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, as far like with the short stories, I love seeing adaptations. I just wish I saw more good ones. Like, even for like, uh, um, there was a, just a little off topic, but the uh, there was this night shift uh, story called Quitters Inc. Yes, about a guy. Yeah, that one I wanted to see something. I want to see something up to date on that. That would just be the whole thought behind that, especially now with uh, where we are with uh, smoking and vaping and everything. I just think it would be a really fun story to see. Yeah, there are certain ones that would benefit from updates, to say the least. And I know that there was the Nightmares and Dreamscape show that was an anthology of some of these stories. I haven't watched that yet. Is that something you have seen? I've seen uh, bits and pieces, I think. It was, I don't remember what year that even came out, but I was either really young and didn't have control or, <laughs> but no, I, I don't remember um, very much of the Nightmares and Dreamscapes um actual series yeah it was done in 2005 so a little oh, yeah. more recent quite a while after the collection came out i actually just bought it but obviously with me going in chronological order it'll be a minute before i get to it but dennis i think that wraps things up with nightmares and dreamscapes thank you so much for coming on to discuss it not a problem thank you for having me of course do you want to plug your socials website anything real quick Oh, God, I love to plug my social media. <laughs> you guys can find me. Uh, my name is Dennis Freeman. I'm an author, and my Instagram and Twitter handle is The Terrorverse, and I'm on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash Dennis Freeman Author. So hopefully I'll see you guys again real soon. 
Great. And before we go, you can support this podcast on Patreon for a dollar a month. You just show your general support. You'll get a thank you on the show for $2 a month. You can get yourself a Chat Cemetery sticker. They're limited right now. So if you want one, definitely sign up on Patreon. You can find us at Chat Cemetery on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And as always, thank you all for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.